Britain has a very long history and relationship with Afghanistan that spans, you know, decades and generations. And yet Afghans have this unfamiliarity with Britain and its system and its values. Um, and so I've been back to Afghanistan for many years uh, over the last 20 and sort of every year or over two years. And one thing I can safely say, uh, when people ask me, have we failed in Afghanistan? My instant response, uh, and one that I have heard very commonly uh, uh, from, uh, from young people in Afghanistan, is that no, Britain and the West did not fail in Afghanistan. A lot had, ch uh, had changed. Um, we had seen illiteracy rates skyrocket. Women were in public uh, uh, mainstream society. They were in a university. There were coffee shops. I mean, I remember going to Afghanistan the first time in 2006. I remember stepping into the airport and I was wrapped up with a scarf a lot more tighter than a young girl who lived there and I was terrified I was like oh my god it's scary it's it's this is a, a country that's been in war for, for, for generations and you know this is a country that's known for extremism and terrorism I was actually scared and I wore sort of a hijab and, and properly covered and I w when I entered th the city of Kabul there were girls with mu the, their their, I mean, it was interesting their scarves were falling down their hair there was a lot more hair being shown tops were much shorter jeans and they just walked around Kabul city um, as if it's, I don't know, Southorn in London. And I was honestly inspired. I knew that there was something that these, y these young people were, were, were striving for. And Afghanistan, as many other countries in the developing world, is dominated uh, by sort of a, a young generation. About 75% of Afghanistan's population is under 25. I think the average age is 18. So many of them have never even lived under Taliban rule. This was a whole new generation uh, and a country that wanted and, to, uh, and wanted to accept, I guess, Western values or British values of democracy, uh, of, of freedom, of equality and tolerance. Um, and I think what we actually failed in, the failure is less that we didn't win the war, the failure was that we didn't have the patience and the commitment. I mean, what is it, f how can you expect a country that had no infrastructure, ha was basically a blank canvas in 2001, there were no hotels, no roads, no schools, and you expect it after 20 years to stand on its own two feet and to figure it out on its, uh, by, uh, on its own. Afghanistan's always been a foreign aid dependent country, uh, historically, it's never had its own economy, unfortunately. I think, I mean, I can go back to the history of Afghanistan, but it will take much longer. Uh, unfortunately, the foundations and, and in 1747, when Afghanistan was created, it wasn't created to be a modern state. And that's where the problem starts. It's a very tribal, traditional society made up of many different ethnic groups who struggle to unite. And the one thing they actually united and were able to sort of sit under the same umbrella under was democracy. It was the freedom to vote, the freedom to elect their own government, their own leaders, hold them to account, a free media, where I think in, uh, in the last 20 years, Afghanistan had the most open media than even Pakistan or many other Central Asian countries, Iran, for example, as well. Many other neighboring countries were inspired at how openly critical the Afghan media was of its own leaders for fear of no fear <laughs> of, of repercussions uh, whereas you know uh, currently it's completely the opposite but there was there was a lot of hope and every time I traveled I saw more difference and more security and and a better and a better future for the country and last year August I think it shocked not only the people of Afghanistan but the world that we'd entered a point where we've completely lost hope that Afghanistan could ever be changed. And the narrative shifted. You know, people started to believe that the people of Afghanistan didn't want and didn't accept our, our, our values and, our, and democracy. And for some reason, I, I was very confused. I thought, actually, the evidence says differently. Why is the narrative changing? Why is the media saying that we failed? Why is the media making it seem like the Afghan people didn't want us and they accepted the Taliban? Well, it was actually the contrary. 
it wasn't that the, that the Afghan people didn't fight. First of all, Afghanistan had an army of about 400,000, and I'm sure you may recall, but after 2013, we didn't hear any more British soldiers being killed in Afghanistan or injured. Because after 2013, the NATO forces and British forces were basically there as morale, as a support system, as, as a mechanism or a system where you provide training and equipment. But you weren't, we weren't fighting, the Afghan forces were fighting. And we were simply there to ensure that they were, they were on the battleground and they were fighting terrorism every day, which many Afghans wanted to. The problem started when, Af when the forces were told to put their weapons down because, and it was, again, the Afghan government had many problems over the years. Corruption was one of it. P salaries weren't being paid. And to be honest, when everyone, the world has stepped aside and said, we don't want to do anything here anymore. We've given hope. How can you expect Afghan forces who, most of them live in poverty to fight? I mean, right now in Ukraine, we're, we're sending billions in aid and, and equipment and weapons. And yet you expect it in a country like Afghanistan to fight on its own. It's bizarre. It was honestly, I think, not only did it feel offensive, but it felt like we didn't understand Afghanistan right from the beginning. We didn't understand its people. We didn't understand its history, its geography, what the country represented and where it came from. And so 20 years on, in, uh, in August last year, 15th, the world decided it didn't matter anymore and we've had enough and we don't want to do anything here. I understand billions in aid were invested, lives, countless lives were lost. It was a very, very difficult task to be in Afghanistan and to fight extremism and terrorism and this barbaric, backward mentality. But we also need to understand that Afghanistan is the heart of Asia. Why did we go to Afghanistan in the first place? We acknowledged that security in Afghanistan meant security not only in the region, but globally. It's always been the case. There were mistakes that were made. I mean, that's evident in, the, in terms of our foreign policy, in terms of our international aid, our interventionism, how we actually set about introducing Western values to Afghanistan. But it, what I think I'm trying to say is that it just needed reform and change and understanding. It didn't, need, it didn't require us to take a step back, retreat, and give up altogether. And the fear right now, I mean, I'm sure you've all been reading the news. Um, in September last year, when the Taliban came back to Afghanistan, people said, well, this is Taliban 2.0. This is a different Taliban. This is a different group, and they have governance. Uh, administrative skills now and they will be able to run a country actually the contrary is true they have better PR they use social media now they're on Twitter spaces which is really interesting you go on a Twitter space you hear a, a Taliban either a Taliban spokesperson or a supporter there or m one of their members actually in a Twitter space communicating to the general the international audience that's what's changed about the Taliban they've modernized with technology but their ideology hasn't changed. N we're almost two months away from one year of Taliban takeover, and Afghan women have been forced to wear the burqa or the hijab. They've been told to stay at home or to avoid leaving the house unless it's very, very necessary. They've told women don't really have the need to work um, unless it's you know, very ex ex exceptional circumstances. Women are now being slowly removed from TV. I think just only two weeks ago, they were, for, they were uh, ordered to wear veils or masks on national TV. They're banned from school. At primary age, just last week, I was shocked to hear that girls who go to primary schools aged between nine and 12 should be wearing a, a face veil, should cover their faces. There is, no one, there is not one Muslim country in the world that you can name to, to me right now where women are forced at such a young age to wear a face veil. It's a child. And beyond that, we have poverty at such a high level where 97% of the population is almost starving. It's a human tragedy. Uh, sort of unfolding. We have different ethnic groups being persecuted uh, by the Taliban. Those who had any former 
uh, affiliations with the British government, with NATO, with the international community, the former army officials, um, uh, those who worked with international agencies, NGOs, anyone that showed support for our work in Afghanistan are either detained, killed, and you never hear of them again. There was actually one case that really struck me where a mother, a former police officer, a female police officer in Afghanistan, was taken from her home and shot right in front of her family members outside her home. I mean, this is, this is what we've ended up doing. How do we not realize what a mistake it was? This, this didn't need to happen. And what we also seem to fail to understand is that security in Afghanistan will and is already slowly entering neighboring countries. The Taliban have attacked already, I think, Uzbekistan. They've attacked Tajikistan. They're entering the Iranian borders. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.